Greetings, legendary listeners. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And today we are all about the premiere of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Every week we analyze the latest chapter of the MCU from all sorts of unique angles. On Monday, Christine Kippens and I will bring you our character cast, which will take stock of the fates and choices of Sam, Bucky, and more. On Wednesday, Jesse Taylor and our show PonderVision will return to get into the premiere's biggest and weirdest questions. But as always, we begin our weekly analysis with this show, StoryCast. This is where we break down TV episodes not by plot, but by themes, symbols, illusions, and archetypes. You won't get this kind of analysis on any other Marvel pod. You won't even get this on any TV pod. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and today I am joined by our two story experts, from Salon.com, writer Amanda Marcotte. Hey, Amanda. Hey. And from Manhattan College, professor of English, Maeve Adams. Howdy, Dr. A. Hey there. You know, I think it's because I miss Katherine Hahn, but I I feel like leaning into the Dr. A, the evil, evil Dr. A. I think you're going to have a growing <laughs> fandom slash henchman uh, population behind you in the <laughs> podcast audience. So we're here I'm here for, for it. it. Look, we're super excited to get into this wild premiere, but before we do, we do want to pause and acknowledge that there's been a rise in violence in the real world, especially violence targeting the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. So we want to send our thoughts to everyone in Atlanta after the horrible shootings there that left eight people dead. But thoughts are not always enough, let's be honest. So Maeve, what else can folks do? So I know that, you know, folks may be in a position like I am feeling pretty powerless uh, in situations like this. But there are several organizations that you can make a monetary contribution to if you have the resources that support people affected by violent racism and xenophobia, particularly in the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. So we'll recommend just three. There are lots out there and you can do your own research. Um, But three that I know of uh, that I understand are, are doing really great work in those communities. Red Canary Song. Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and Asian American Feminist Collective. Yeah, look those folks up. And if you can, donate. Otherwise, maybe share a tweet or an Instagram post and let folks know about those organizations. So now let's dive back into the world of Falcon and the Winter Soldier and this premiere titled New World Order. To break it down, we'll do three things. First, dive into the themes driving the narrative. Second, explore some pivotal scenes related to those themes. And third, talk about some works of literature that also work with those themes and might serve as inspiration for this episode. So let's begin with those themes, shall we? Amanda, what do you think was the theme of this episode? So, I mean, the big theme I took away from it's very simple, alienation. Every character throughout this, main character anyway, throughout this episode was alienated. You have Bucky, who's an alienated man at a time, who's alienated from basically his entire community, whose phone doesn't even have contacts in it. (laughs) (laughs) You have Sam, who's alienated from his family, who's alienated because he was blipped. (laughs) Um, And you have, you know, kind of ancillary characters. But, you know, I think also just literally every person who was snapped out of existence and then blipped re back into existence is invoked in this episode as a person that's alienated from their community because they literally have just been gone for five years and they thought it was five seconds and, and they don't have jobs. They don't have homes. They can't get money that blah, 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 blah. But like everything about this was actually kind of exploring the the kind of narratives of alienation that I think are are more common um, to like returning from war type narratives mm. than uh, usually you get in kind of science fiction with with one exception, which we will talk about, I'm sure. Let's get into some more specifics around these characters. Let's start with Bucky, who I feel like really jumped out to all of us as the character most connected to this kind of a theme. What did you see from Bucky that really stood out? Well, I mean, like I said, he's clearly like a super alienated character from himself and from his community. And he's very much, like I said, plugged into the returning from war narrative, which was has there's variations of this after World War II, after Vietnam, mm. after World War One. I, I think is actually probably some of the most interesting stories we have about what happens to people in the time that they come back from the war. And they've built their entire identity around 
being a fighter and what is it like to try to just like live a normal life? Yeah. It, it's interesting to me because Bucky's kind of like two narratives, I think. He's he's both like a World War II vet who was in the Howling Commandos. So you get the yeah. kind of band and bro- band of brothers narrative and mm. and losing that and losing that kind of wo- war identity. But then he was also the Winter Soldier. So he's a little bit more of um related to the kind of PTSD laden character that we are more familiar with of with stories of people coming back from Vietnam. Yeah, which were just fundamentally two... I mean, we know this, it's obvious, right? That these were fundamentally two very distinctive experiences, but they were distinctive in really interesting ways that I think this show is trying to get us to think about by way of exactly what you're talking about, Amanda, right? The alienation that uh, a soldier experiences when returning from war. Because like the alienation that a soldier experiences from you know, in returning from the first or the second world wars is an alienation that we might describe as an alienation from himself, right? So, hmm. you know, the, the, the this is just true of, you know, of, of, of soldiers' experience in war, right? They have to go to war and they have to set aside a key component of what makes us human. And even from a kind of biological standpoint, right, we, we are designed at, at the level of our DNA, I mean, not designed, but we are, our, our DNA drives us to not destroy our own species. I want to be clear, I'm not here touting the principles of intelligent design just to be totally transparent about that. <laughs> uh, but there, there is inside of us a, an instinct to, to preserve the species. Yeah. And, and one of the things about Winter Soldier that's super interesting is like, in a very science fiction way, he takes that way that soldiers are trained to set aside the human part of themselves that is empathetic yeah. and doesn't want to kill. Like that's a thing that t- soldiers have to be trained to set that aside. And he is like literally brainwashed Manchurian candidate style. Totally. To be alienated from his humanity in that way. So he's, he's again, like science fiction is often just full of that ripe symbolism in that yeah. way. I mean, what's interesting, I mean, so to go back to the point that you were making um, a little bit earlier, like, right, so he embodies these two positions, right, the soldier returning from war. And in the in in the First and Second World War narratives, we, ha- you know, we, we get soldiers returning from war who can't recognize themselves fully, because, you know, they've been at war and having to experience this stripping away of their own humanity in order to identify you know, in order to be able to say, here are my friends, here are my foes, and my foes, I'm going to kill them, <laughs> right? Because that's what war requires, right? And so when that soldier returns from war, the benefit that he has it coming back from the First and Second World Wars, you know, the ticker tape parades aren't just celebrations, they're also an opportunity for that soldier to be able to see himself as a hero, right? Mm-hmm. The soldier who returns from Vietnam doesn't get to see himself that way. So he's not just alienated with respect to himself, He's alienated with respect to all the other humans that might help him remember his sense of belonging, remember that he belongs to this community. And textually in this episode, there's a lot of information that connects to this theme. The one that jumps out the most to me was his dating troubles, right? Bucky in First (laughs) Avenger was the ultimate ladies man. He's hanging out in front of Howard Stark, a person he would later assassinate, by the way, as the Winter Soldier. But he's he's effortlessly charming with anyone and everyone he meets, whereas this Bucky is utterly mystified by Tinder and can <laughs> barely last probably 20 <laughs> minutes on his date after bringing her flowers, which she really thought was kind of weird and old fashioned. Well, what's funny is like this is the one kind of science fiction narrative that really does often kind of dwell on these like ideas of alienation and being an immigrant or a refugee. And those Mm -hmm. are like time travel stories, right? Captain America is a classic time travel story, but even like back to the future (laughs) movies like that, where you're literally the, the whole point of the narrative driving force is that this is a person whose context has been stripped from them Mm. and they are in a completely different context. Maybe it's the past and they, they theoretically understand it, but when you actually get there, it's never exactly what you think it's going to be like in back to the future. Um, it's a lot of time it's played for comedy, but not always. There are very serious time travel stories, but almost always time travel stories are about a person who maybe like Bucky was very socially competent in his normal Mm. world, uh, like a person in a foreign country, except it's still his country. It's just a different time. 
He doesn't know the mores. He doesn't know the language. He doesn't know what tiger photo is. I am also an old. I I I, I don't. Know <laughs> I didn't what... know what tiger photo was. I gotta be gotta be honest. Uh, I I didn't either. So we're all olds here. <laughs> I'm not 106 years old, but apparently I'm. You know, I'm old. You might as well be, be Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if I asked my students, they'd be like, um. Uh, Dr. Adams or now Dr. A, since they'll probably totally identify with that. (laughs) Exactly. They'll be like, uh, and they always explain things uh, that I don't understand that are from their universe in these really patient, generous ways. I mean, maybe because they don't want to sort of make me feel alienated because I grade them. Um, (laughs) But they always have these really patient explanations. So, you know, I look forward to that. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing photo. there will be an article somewhere that'll help me understand that one. But that is far from the only thing that signified Bucky being a fish out of water. He yeah. is caught in those nightmares of his past traumas. Oof. And even when he's asked to fight in this modern nonviolent style, you can tell he's wrestling and struggling with the rules that they've imposed on him to, to change his ways. He's really none of it feels natural to him anymore. It's a technological alienation in that sense, right? There's a sort of interesting way that the show manifests that as as technological alienation. Practices, techniques, and technologies are all kind of bound up for Bucky as mm. the things he just cannot adopt. And like to go back to Amanda's point about this is an immigrant story. He's, a, he's an immigrant in a foreign land. If you wanted to get really nerdy, obviously the word for this is semiotics. <laughs> It's like, true. It's, uh, you know, like there's language and then there's semiotics, which is obviously like everything outside of of just language, but like all the, the symbologies that we live in. And, and we don't think about it very much, but there's the semiotics of the iPhone. Well, semiotics includes language, but yes, yeah, it does. But like yeah. it's a, an umbrella. But like that's what I'm saying. It's you would say that for things that are outside of just language as well yeah. like how to use an iphone what whether the fact that you don't anymore bring flowers on a date though mm. obviously <laughs> she liked that um yeah these are all the sorts of things that you just know from living in a world and he just doesn't know it anymore and and that is a symbol mm. his but what's cool is in the captain america movies they use the fact that he's a man out of time mostly for comedy there's some poignancy, but he is pretty well adapted and adaptable to the time he's living in because like, because Steve is, is integrated with himself really well. And so he can immigrate to another time Hmm. and, and, and function well because he's sure of himself, but Bucky is not a person who is stable or sure of himself. So his lack of anchors is making his own alienation from himself much worse. Yeah. So Bucky might be the most obvious example of our fish out of water, man out of time story, but he is far from the only one. And you hinted at this earlier, Amanda. Sam himself, because of the blip, is also out of time now. His credit record is a mess and the banker goes right for that. He's missed his nephews growing up and you can tell that that bothers him. He wasn't able to be there for his sister, which has opened up this resentment gulf between them, even though his his sister understands rationally about this, it's still hard on her. And there's yeah. an experience gap that they just can't close easily. Even their whole business, small business in general, their family's legacy is this dying concept that the world seems to want to brush aside as part of the quote unquote, new world order. Was there anything else about Sam that jumped out to y'all as part of this theme about being alienated? I would say that What's cool is like it also just like with Bucky, it's like the most immediate cause of it is the time travel. But Hmm. you see signs that this was always a piece of their character, right? Hmm. She 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 fingers Sam for being alienated from the family because he left to go be in the Air Force. That's true. Right. She she mentions that he, he ran away, basically. Yeah, she's left with carrying forward the family legacy. It's like, you know, I'm sure lots of folks who are watching this will recognize in her the the person who has to sacrifice, you know, any other kind of, you know, imagined trajectory of their lives and where they carry on the family business because they're the one that's willing to stay behind. Um, you and know, she wants to fair some in some ways. Of course, yes. 
But, but yeah. even Sam and Sarah's kitchen is outdated, and they talk about how even that needs to get modernized, <laughs> and they just feel like nothing is caught up. I and mean, we think, like, Bucky, it's been 90 years or whatever. For yeah. Sam, it, well, it's not been 90 years. Bucky's out of time from the from the 40s, so it's not an awful 90 years, but it's been a long time. It's many decades. And Sam, it's only been five years, but think about it. If you had to like go back to yourself five years ago, you would also, because technology moves so fast, yeah, oh my feel God. out of time. You Like the phones and the computers and everything would probably be surprisingly alienating. You're like, we I'm like, where's my Palm now? Pilot? <laughs> well, forget the tech. It's the relationships, right? That's what yeah. Sam's really struggling with. Anyone yeah. that's young in your life is going to be in a totally different place. Anyone who's old in your life might be gone. It's yeah. it's all about the people and how much we all change without even realizing it after five years. Yeah, your spouse probably remarried. Right? I mean, five years? You would hope so. If you love your spouse, you would want them to find somebody. Well, and it, it does raise some really interesting questions about... How do we understand community as a sh- as a set of c- collectively shared experiences, right? Because that that is that is true of the way that we understand community, the way that we understand nas- national nationality. That these are a set of collectively shared experiences. What happens when five people five people have disappeared for five years? Like yeah. half the world, like your community. I mean, it's a crisis of community. And the show is reckoning head on with all the dimensions of that uh, in an episode that we probably, or at least I, expected to be, you know, a lot of joking quippiness between two people who are forced to be friends, who, as it turns out, never meet in the episode. Yeah, right, are right. alienated yeah. from each other. And this theme connects yeah. them, but you're right. They are technically very alienated because Bucky is literally not returning Sam's texts. I mean, just literally in a family, think about what it would be like. Ugh. You have a photo, like think of the symbol of a family photo album, right? Oh my God. And yeah. for five years of it, half of those people are gone. Like yeah. how do they fit into the narrative of the family? If you've ever had a family member who dropped off the face of the earth and then you found yeah. them again, um, you've probably recognized some of the emotional turmoil, but this is on a grand scale. Yeah. Yeah. Sam and Bucky aren't alone here either. Yori, Bucky's friend, who turns out to be the father of someone Bucky killed, is also stuck in a loop since the death of his son. He just can't move on. It's turning him into a bitter and isolated person. I felt like he also fit your alienation theme. Mm. Yeah, I and it's something that they deal with some in Endgame very slightly, and I think WandaVision dealt with in more depth, which is like, it must be a particularly alienating for people whose family members just died, died. Who don't get someone back when everyone comes back. Exactly. Yeah. So to watch everybody else get their people back and your person is gone forever must just be alienation on top of alienation because you are now alienated from this experience that everyone else gets to have of at least the happy return. Yeah. I mean, it's, Yuri, Yuri is interesting, especially sort of along the dimension of this being a story about about community, about belonging, right? That, you know, and about alienation from community because Yori can't, Yori can basically only connect with Bucky. Yori and Bucky share a deeply profound sense of alienation that results from a history of violence, right? The sad thing, of course, is that Bucky has caused the violent uh, event that makes Yori feel alienated from the world to the extent that he can't even you know, it's like one thing that we think about when it comes to share to community is sharing resources, right? That's just a kind of fundamental question and 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 conception of community is that we share resources. When your neighbor runs out of flour and they come over, you're not a dick and you don't, and don't give it to them. Like you give they them don't the just fucking throw flour. Throw some in their face and slam the door. <laughs> exactly. You're like welfare state. I hate it. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> right. whatever. Like however they might concede. You know, whatever. Like it's just a dick move. Um, but you know, my point is that you know that 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 his neighbor is like, can I just put my trash into your garbage can that is not full, and your can't even rise to the level of like, of course, because it's not full. Like, why would I? Why would I deny you access to this resource? We can share this, and we we are all New Yorkers at like of some point in our life. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we can safely say that, like, while there are fights over trash cans, you would probably just let this person do it. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, I literally just let someone put something in our trash can the other day because they were like, our trash can is full and the, the trash doesn't get collected for two days. And I was like, of course you, I mean, uh, even if it weren't full, like, I, I mean, even if it were full, it would be fine to stack it on top as long as it's not spilling smelly shit all over this, all over our patio area. <laughs> Letting the people, the the people, the listeners who are not in the Northeast cities know this is normal. (laughs) Yeah, super normal because it's worse when the trash is on the ground and you have to walk by it or smell it or whatever. It's better to get it in somebody's can over the sidewalk 100% of the time. Yeah. Maeve, talk to me about some other thematic concepts you might have noticed in this episode. Did anything else jump out? Well, I don't think this would necessarily be something... Uh, totally different, but maybe a different way of thinking about what we've been talking about. Um, You know, the standard superhero story is a story about identity, right? It's a story about a character who, according to the kind of traditional hero's journey, um, right, sort of is given special powers or is given an opportunity to do something extraordinary and then has a crisis where they're like, who am I? Spider-Man, who am I? Batman, who am I? Right? Like, what am I going to do in the world? What am I going to do for the world with these new, these newfound powers? This is fundamentally different. It's not to say that Bucky and Sam aren't asking the question, who am I? But the way that that question gets framed is, with whom do I belong? To what Mm. do I belong? Right? My identity is wrapped up it's not just about me. This is not just a navel-gazing experience. This is entirely about community, right? That my identity is bound up with the identity of the community. And that is a just that that's a fundamentally different way of understanding the question of identity. Because it's always about it's not just about you and how you conceive of yourself or your own psychological depth or like, have I figured out my crisis personally? But how do I do that with others? In a superhero comic, it's what are my powers? And do I have a secret identity or not or whatever, all that stuff. Yeah, that's such a good point. How do you see that manifesting in this episode specifically? Well, I mean, you know, we see it from we see it from the very beginning and we see it in a series of scenes that sort of unfold in this really fascinating way, right? So the one of the things that I think is really spectacular about this show, especially uh, you know, sort of following up on the heels of WandaVision is that it doesn't tell a linear narrative. Hmm. Right? So we start with the scene that you know, Sam is kind of reckoning with whether or not he's going to take up the mantle of the shield. He's ironing his shirt, right? He's doing this kind of very mundane domestic thing. And then we we transition to a kind of interruption in that narrative because what's supposed to happen immediately after that is he's supposed to go to Washington and and decide whether, you know, sort of hand off the shield to the Smithsonian or not. And it goes somewhere else, right? It goes to him saving the uh, American soldier um, from the right. terrorists. And, and then, of course, also what we have immediately after that is the introduction of Bucky, right? And Bucky's, Bucky's past and then Bucky's present. And in both of these cases, we have somebody reckoning with the ways in which they belong to community. So, you know, Sam is like, do I, am I going to be Captain America? Am I going to belong to the superhero story? Am I going to belong to America and the, and the values that it, 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 and do I feel like I belong? Right? Like, cause that's that question, right? It's not, it's not, do I want to belong? He obviously does, but do I feel like I belong to this story? Right. Um, and Bucky, I think is, is, is reckoning with the same kind of thing. What story do I belong to? How do I tell a new, and that's that therapeutic context, that we see brought back from WandaVision, right? Like, what's the story I can tell about my life that makes sense, that places me in in a world, that places me in a world with other people? One, well, it's so interesting because the the symbol of the shield is super critical in this episode. Yeah. And what's funny about that is the shield actually illustrates exactly the concept that you're saying, Maeve. Like, Captain America has been disconnected from the person of Steve Rogers. Like the concept Mm. of Captain America, like there's the classic superhero story in Captain America. Steve Rogers fits into that. Like I am this unique person. The world is shaped around me. Right. But Cap Steve Rogers is gone. The the person is gone. Uh, The shield, the concept 
of Captain America continues to exist. That actually kind of gets to the idea of like a community kind of creates these roles and people step into them. And it's interesting because it's complicated. Like Sam says something I think is really profoundly true, which is symbols are nothing without the women and men who give them meaning. I mean, I don't know that they're nothing. That's the point, right? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. the symbol exists, like Captain America exists. And I think he was kind of, he, well, he, he's not wrong. Obviously if there's, if the shield's in the force and no one's there to look at it, it means nothing. <laughs> yeah. But like he, he's using this to say Captain America was, the meaning of it was imbued by in the body of Steve Rogers, this human being, right? The single yeah. person who was Captain America. Whereas actually what he kind of is, I think, set it, setting up to be, to be taught by kind of life experience is that Captain America is actually given meaning by all the people perceiving and narrating and believing in and, and giving meaning to Captain America, just like we did in the last episode where we just talked at length about what does Captain America mean? Steve <laughs> Rogers isn't a real person. Yeah. <laughs> and yet we have a relationship to Captain America because he's a symbol. Right. Well, that is, that's, yeah, that's really brilliant. That's really brilliant. I mean, I think also because what it reveals is that myth making and the symbols that emerge from myth making is always a collective enterprise, right? We don't make myths by ourselves, right? We make myths in collectives, and those myths then reinforce the idea that the collective has value as a collective, that it's a unifying force. There's a kind of there's a reciprocity or we might say like a recursiveness about those ideas. The community gets together. They make myths together. They make the symbols that back those myths up and make, give those myths symbolic meaning. And then the sharing of those myths reinforce the idea that the collective matters, that it's real. Even if the story, even if they're just stories we're telling, the collective is the real thing. And you're right, that because what it means is that the audience is far more important than any of the symbols themselves, right? It could be a teapot, right? It doesn't need to be a shield that blocks all, um, you know, violent forces, right? Like a magical shield. It doesn't have to be a magical shield. It yeah. could be literally anything. It's the collective that matters. I think you mean a scientific shield, Maeve. It's still science, <laughs> you know? It's all science. It's all about science. But it also is, despite this, and I think it's very, very clear, it matters who stands in the, the shoes of the symbol. Yes. And Sam is not wrong to believe that. I think we've all dealt with that fact with the White House. The White House is a profound oh. symbol of this yeah. nature. It is the symbol of the presidency. It is the symbol of the power of the United States. It imbues a person with blah, 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 blah. I think it really matters who sits there. <laughs> well, especially when that person who sits there violates the values yeah. that that symbol stands for, like literally every single day. <laughs> the person who sits there has a lot of power over what that symbol can mean. <laughs> yeah, and I think we're going to find that out with this new, very punchable white guy that rolls in at the oh end of the episode. God. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, if this guy is not going to be a symbol of Trump violating the White House, I'm, I will be shocked. <laughs> Well, especially because they set us up for that, right? So the introduction of this new, slightly like grinny, doughy, uh, white, very white Captain America it is we need a real person Ugh. who embodies America's greatest values, which is so incredibly disturbing in the context of a narrative that starts with them offering it to a black American man. Yeah, and and, right? and really when you think about our recent political context, hmm, there's a exactly. lot of weight there that like the shield for a brief shining moment was in the hands of this worthy black man. <laughs> and now... <laughs> Well, not I mean, now, obvi thankfully. Obvi <laughs> but yeah. Obviously, Barack Obama didn't turn it down. Like, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. But no, I think no, that course. anyone who overlooks the symbolic weight of, of Sam being uncomfortable with this role and yeah. not realizing that he kind of needed to step into it and that that he is the person to step into it, I think. It, it, it. Well, he's also offered the opportunity to rethink his position. Right. <laughs> so basically, Rhodes, you know, so in that scene, in the Smithsonian, Rhodes gives Sam a second chance to think this through, right? Or at right. least that's what, 
you know, that that's what it sounds like. And then all of a sudden we're being introduced to a quote unquote real person embodying <laughs> American values. I mean, it's, it's disturbing in the way that in some, you know, it's, it's not unfamiliar to us. This is not some kind of like those of us who live in modern America, like we know racism isn't over and the show doesn't, the show knows that too. And also just anybody who's lived through the past few years. And like <laughs> I said in the last episode, if they fail to just grapple with like even symbolically, they will have fallen down on the job because it's going to yeah. ring empty um, if they don't grapple with kind of the symbols of Americanness and the racial identity of the people that are in it. And they do actually do that in in a way that I was thrilled. It was so it was so subtle. It was so beautifully done. Right. So, so many times over and over again in this episode, not least of which is that moment where, you know, Sam is with his sister in the bank, right, asking for the loan. And the loan officer finally determines that even though they qualify for a VA loan, they're not going to get one. Right. And he, what he says is if a lot of, you know, lots of people are applying and so things tighten up. And Sam's sister says, funny how things always tighten around us. Now that is, I mean, that tiny, whoever wrote that piece of dialogue, I would like, I would like to congratulate them on perfect double meaning, right? So she's mm -hmm. referencing the history of redlining, right? Which was a practice, a, a, an authorized practice of banks to turn loans down to black Americans. Right. And those of us, as you said, Amanda, who have lived for the through the past, you know, four years, Funny how things always tighten around us is all is 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 it has to resonate with the brutal the police brutality against Black Americans, right? It's impossible not to hear it that way, as far as I'm concerned, in the context of our recent history. So, somebody positing an entirely different idea of community are the flag smashers, who this episode mm. suggests don't want anything to do with symbols of nationalism or patriotism at all, but imagine a world free from governments like these. At least that's what they're saying. Is that what they really believe? We'll find <laughs> out. But they're, the way they're drawing people in is with a seductive ideology of essentially one world government and no mm. more national boundaries, borders, etc. I thought that was a really interesting juxtaposition with these questions of what it means to be an American, to be a black American, uh, to be a modern American, in the case of Bucky, all that mm. stuff. So I thought the flag smashers fit into kind of what you're talking about here, Maeve, in terms of the community aspect of this identity question. Well, and I and I also think there's something really mm, uh, new, maybe. Maybe not exactly new, but there's something pretty radical about what the show is trying to insert into the standard, you know, sort of um, action flick uh, you know, sort of nationalistic story because when Sam, you know, comes back from his mission saving the American soldier, he and his uh, buddy have this conversation which introduces this uh, skepticism around the idea of national borders and their value in the world. And that qu that question doesn't get resolved, right? So, I mean, what I'm hoping is the show sort of capitalizes on this and keeps moving in the direction of, of, of never really resolving these. We can't resolve mm -hmm. these questions. I mean, I personally am a fan of the idea that uh, that no person is illegal, yeah. <laughs> right? That there can't be a, a, a conception of a human as illegal. I also understand that it's complicated idea to try to dismantle nation states. Yeah, I, I think the show's probably, I mean, they are the bad guys. They're going to end up being bad. I, so, I think and hope that they end up being bad guys like Killmonger and Black Panther, which is bad guys mm. who have an argument that's seductive and compelling and, and often right on some level until you kind of think it all the way through, you know, but maybe we'll bring up some ideas that will challenge our heroes own ideologies and make them sharper and better people. But I think it is an interest. You can kind of see how the blip would have done this to people, right? Mm -hmm. Like Sam says, a symbol is, is imbued with meaning by the people, the mm. men and women who give it meaning. And if a na a nation, a flag is its people, this comes up in Thor Ragnarok with the Asgardians and how they leave Asgard and they have to really reckon with the idea that Asgard is a people, not a place. 
But when half of the world disappears, that's flipped on its head. The United States, what is it with half of its people gone? Is it the same country? And then now they're back. So I, I can kind of see that there probably was a point in those five years where some nations perhaps were changing their borders or changing their national identity to adjust to these new realities. It's kind of hinted at. And now that all these people are back, it's just like a reset button on national identity. And for the flag smashers, I suspect we're going to find that they, they said that they liked it better before the blip. They liked it when half of people were gone because they saw it as an opportunity to tear down these identities but at the end of the day, national identities aren't a bad thing. Well, they don't have to be. They don't have to be, yeah. The problem comes in when people start doing things like, you know, not allowing new people into your nation or aligning your national identity right. with a race or a, a reactionary ideology. But like, again, Captain America is an American character, <laughs> And he imbues all the things that are great about America. And I don't think that any of us would be happy to see America as a concept just wiped off the planet. I think the question is, like, make it better. Right. Well, and especially make it better along the lines of what the sh- – like, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that the, the show should be a kind of playbook going forward, but it does raise some really interesting questions about – what does it mean to be American in the wake of a, of a crisis of communal identity? What if it is a series of skeptical stances around rather than tradition-bound sureties, right? Like, is it possible to ask a set of questions about identity as the basis of Americanness that can then result in greater inclusivity? Right. Yeah. What would it mean to say, instead of saying, I know what America is and I and I am American versus what is America? You know, just going back to the to, to the 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 last episode, we, t- you know, Mark mentioned Amanda Gorman's A Nation Unfinished. It's, it's true. <laughs> this show, it seems to be thinking about that. Something that is unfinished requires questions more than answers. Yeah. Well, and and certainly, like, while I suspect that Flag Smashers are going to per- posit themselves a, as a progressive community, um, we all see what's going on in our country with the very notion that fewer people is somehow better. Yeah. And, and it's never good. <laughs> no. Yeah. Amanda, did you notice any other themes in this episode before we move on? Yeah. So, I mean, I think a huge part of Bucky's... Um, journey in this particular episode and, and Sam's as well are based around the concept of debts in the repaying of debts. Um, Bucky has Hmm. literally a debt book. He has a, that's true. (laughs) He has a ledger, a handwritten ledger of people that he owes amends to, and he has to sort of make up amends. And what he finds with Yuri is that there are some debts that, seem almost impossible to be repaid, right? And this is reflected in Sam's own debt problems, which are a little bit less existential and more just dollars and cents debts. But he discovers his assurance that his sister's debts can be paid, that all of this is doable. He gets slapped in the face at the bank with the fact that he doesn't have the income history and whatnot to actually pay down his debts. And so I think what's interesting is these two characters are facing both the literal and kind of spiritual idea of owing a debt. And the question of what Mm. do you do when you discover that what you owe is well beyond what you can repay, is there ever going to be a right, uh, like a point to be made whole again? Can you ever really get there? What does that process look like? And I think that's going to haunt the rest of the season. Hmm. Well, on that note, let's talk about a couple of the pivotal scenes that drive home these themes in the episode. Maeve, are there any scenes that you want to spend some time digging into a little bit more deeply? It might seem like a little bit of a throwaway scene because it's, um, it's, I mean, not because it is the opening scene. It is the opening scene. So no one wants to throw away the opening scene. But we might think of it as a scene that just allows the rest of the episode to unfold. But that opening scene, I think, is really striking, right? It's not your standard superhero scene, right? It's not an action scene that opens the 
the story. It's a scene uh, in which a man with uh, very little music playing over it, right? It doesn't, the music doesn't start immediately. So it's all what we call diegetic sound, right? It all belongs to the scene itself. It's him ironing his shirt, putting the shirt on, and then the music begins. And what's interesting about the way that that scene is put together is that it's just a domestic space. He's got this kind of homemade quilt on his bed. It's not, uh, it's clearly not machine made. This is a quilt that's been handmade. It's, it's handmade. <laughs> I mean, what could I say? It's, uh, you know, it's, it's sweet. Mm. And this scene then ends with him remembering and voiceover of his conversation with Steve Rogers, where Steve Rogers hands him the shield and said, and, you know, basically is like, how do you feel? And he's like, I feel like it's not mine. In some ways, like that's a that's a, a a conversation and a scene that is simply about kind of establishing this character and the crisis that he's going to have to deal with in this episode. But it's also really crucial about belonging, right? Do I belong to the hero's j- story? Do I belong to the American dream? Do I belong to this domestic space? Where is that domestic space? Who else is in that domestic space? It raises all these questions for us that I think are really profound when we watch then the rest of the episode. Yeah, it's interesting because the action scene which follows it, which was just, I mean, absolutely adrenaline rush uh, moment. Yeah. But, you know, it's also about belonging in borders even, just in a much more literal sense. Amanda, I think you were talking about that when we were watching it. Yeah, I mean, the like in Winter Soldier, which is like the kind of best Captain America movie, mm-hmm. they did a really good job of, of the Russo brothers of using action sequences to further themes and symbols of the story. And I think that the action sequence at the top of it shows that a lot has been learned in terms of doing that because the entire action is built around the concept of we have to get this done before we cross a border into another yeah. country with a, with different sovereignty, blah, blah. I'm sure a lot of that Sokovia Accords stuff, <laughs> but, right. um, you know, symbolically it's about the idea of, of knowing of belonging borders, crossing them when you can, when you can't, it, it really is about using the action to drive home some very basic themes of the episode. Yeah. And the opening of that is, you know, not just those two, uh, scenes back to back, but then, we get Bucky's action scene followed by his reflection scene. So it creates this kind of bookend with those four scenes sort of, you know, in a, in a row with one another where, you know, it, it basically kind of duplicates exactly what you're talking about from the films where we have these action scenes that are forwarding or elaborating on the symbolic content, but also offering us a way of thinking about it. These aren't just action scenes for fun, Although they are fun, super fun, <laughs> right? But they they're there for to force us to contemplate and reckon with the bigger politically salient, politically thorny questions that the whole series raises around belonging, around nationalism, around community building, and and how those things intersect with one another. I'd like to introduce a second scene for our discussion, and that's <laughs> Bucky's therapy scene. I was really struck by the claustrophobic filming as he reckons with his loneliness. Yeah. I mean, that scene is, it's really extraordinary because it's, um, you know, the there's claustrophobia there, but there's also this feeling the way that it's shot is very, very different from the realism of the opening scene, which is just like fundamentally kind of like it's an ironing scene. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Like it's just realism. This is kind of surrealistic, right? So, when we first see him in the chair with the with the you know like forest scene behind mm-hmm. him his chair which i think is actually a couch but it looks like a chair the way that it's shot it's pulled this the the shot is pulled back i think it's shot with a kind of wide angle lens so it distorts that couch and just makes it look like a giant chair in which he's like like sort of lost yeah, he looks he's like small. lost in this chair and then all the angles of him thinking through problems and his therapist forcing him to do this reckoning work are all shot not from they're shot from above but they're shot from this really weird angle yeah. that again do this weird distortion that make us feel his feeling of of alienation to go back to Amanda's point yeah and and it's shot in a very modern like very cutting edge style with those like extremely close camera work. That's like something you'd see in like a 
an arty film of like the past couple of years and oh, not not the kind of shot that you would have ever seen in a movie that Bucky would have seen when he was young. Yeah, that's such a good point that that's the filming exact kind of filming style that would make Bucky himself uncomfortable. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell are they trying to do? You know, also tying into our themes, that's where we learn a little bit more about his book of amends and he's trying to make up mm. for things, which feels like his effort to drive forward into this present. But the problem is he doesn't know what that present entails. And that goes back to some of our earlier discussions about him. He's free, but without a purpose. Yeah. And how free is he, though? I mean, again, he's an indebted person. Yeah. And and literally debts are the very thing that makes you not free. <laughs> it's funny because, uh, you know, you know, we live in a country that um, saddles people with debts, but pretends that debt is free, right? Like, you know, how many of us have received credit card offers, offers literally in the last month, sure, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Like it's the idea that we are told, the, the story that we are told is that credit is free. Yeah. That right. it's a way to free yourself. Yeah. Right. From the burdens of daily life. But then those debts have to be repaid. But the truth of the matter is, and obviously his debts are not financial, they're spiritual, they're moral debts. But like like a financial debt, like a debt to society, <laughs> like right. your freedom is contingent on you paying it truly. Yeah. yeah. And he, you know, she tells him he's free and he's like, mm, he doesn't feel free. Well, especially because he doesn't know what to do with his freedom. Yeah, that's kind of what I was meaning. You know, it's like he has he's no purpose to what end. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting because there there is a. There's a long storied tradition in philosophy that t that tries to understand the concept of freedom. I mean, we probably all know this on some kind of instinctual level that this would be the question, right? That, that one of the big questions of philosophy is what does it mean to be free, right? Yeah. And there's a there's a really there's a, a a modern philosopher Benjamin Constant who tried to understand the trajectory of this question and he <laughs> did it in this really kind of uh, uh, concise way. He said, for the ancients, starting with Aristotle, what it meant to be free was to freely work with other people in your community to figure out what would be good for that community. But then your the the directive comes from outside yourself, right? So the community is there. You got to figure out what's good for the community. Your job has been defined for you ahead of time. So he said the ancients had that idea of freedom, that you were free to work towards the good of the community. For the moderns, things changed, that the directive about what you should do with your freedom had to come from inside, yeah. that it was about you determining what you should do and what that would mean for you in the world in this really kind of abstract and vague way that is unsettling, I think. And I, and you know, and Bucky... And I think every, every, you know, imagine if I, you know, showed up five years later and my entire world had disappeared, my community was gone, I didn't recognize anything around me. I might be free to do whatever I wanted, but why? Yeah. For what purpose? Like there's like, wisdom in the ancients there, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the notion that there's some self outside of, of the community is a little bit over exaggerated in in the modern imagination, um, yeah. even psychologists will tell you that often the thing that makes you the happiest is helping others and, and, right. and, and contributing to your community and, and, and work, not like the meaningless yeah. labor of capitalism a lot of time, but I meant like, you <laughs> know, work in, in terms of, of doing good things for other people and, and helping build community and building your, your, the world around you. Well, because, you know, I mean, this is this is an argument that people make um, about universal basic income, which is not to take us t too far away from Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but to simply say the argument against something like universal basic income is that people will just lie around and do nothing. <laughs> but the fact is, is that people don't. Yeah. Like people find meaning in the things that they do in their lives and they want to find meaning. And to bring it back to the show, like Bucky... Bucky was a, we've no Bucky from First Avenger. Bucky was a person whose life had a lot of meaning before he was turned into the Winter Soldier. And why? Because he was a soldier. 
for the U.S. Army who was fighting fascism. Like he had thing, he had normal stuff that everybody else has, and so yeah, it makes a lot of sense that freedom without all these like connections doesn't make any sense. Like it has no value to it. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about literature and film if you guys are game. Talk to me about some connections you found between this episode and other works out there. Well, um, so I'm always obsessing about Game of Thrones, <laughs> or, or really the Song of Ice and Fire series by George R. R. Martin. Um, I'm not just a show person. I read the books many times. <laughs> um, and, and it's an interesting book. It's an interesting story because I could think of a lot of people who've watched it, it the the show and the books get so involved quickly in the war that's contemporary in the books but it, as it starts off it's actually a book about people trying to live their lives after the war and some of them are good at it like mm. Ned right but some of them are utter failures like uh King Robert Baratheon <laughs> Right. <laughs> and I was so reminded of King Robert Baratheon when I was watching both Bucky and Sam kind of try to live in the world without a fight. And he's just, mm -hmm. all he can do is sit around and drink and be like, gods, I was strong then. <laughs> and, and, and really just like completely immersed in nostalgia of what it was like to be a warrior. And now he's not, he's a king. And it's really framed in the book as the king is the peacemaker. The, the king is a person who actually has to run shit. And he is not good at that. And I think both Sam and Bucky have a very similar struggle, which is like, Sam's not an Avenger anymore. And he doesn't know how to define himself outside of being an Avenger and having the fight. And and, and the bank and the, the farm or the fishing business and all that other stuff it's just not him. He's not the king. He's he's the general. And, hmm. yeah. and the same with uh, Bucky, who was the warrior, is, again, a very classic, the warrior returning home, doesn't know what to do with himself story. There are a lot of versions of the story, but I, I really, if for fans of sci-fi and fantasy, I, I bring it back to Game of Thrones. I do think, you know, you, you've got a really excellent point about the about this fitting in with a, a we could think about this as a genre of the soldier returning from war and we were talking earlier about the fact that it's 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 about the soldier and their sense of identity coming home it's also about the community around them and there's another work that came to mind when we when i was watching this and when as we've been talking about it and that's uh, a very short novel, like basically a novella um, written in 1918 by Rebecca West called, appropriately enough, The Return of the Soldier. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I would highly recommend this as, a, as something to read um, in, in large part because you think when you pick up the book that this is a story primarily about what happens when a soldier returns from war, but it's actually told about the three women who live in the house of this soldier as the soldier who has PTSD comes home. And what does it mean for the community? What does it mean for the family when a soldier returns who can't remember who he was? Not that he has no memory. I mean, there are some memory issues in this novel, but it's not just about a it's not just a problem of memory. It's a problem of knowing who you are and knowing who you are with respect to an entire community of people who have to re-embrace you, uh, you know, trauma and all, um, or questions about who you are and all. It, it's interesting because, you know, we talked about World War II and we talked about Vietnam, but probably the literature of the people coming back from World War I is some of the richest of all time. And it is like, literally they were labeled the lost generation. Hmm. Yeah. Because the idea at the time was that they were so broken by the war and probably the Spanish flu, I think a thing we can all kind of yeah. understand now yeah. in a way that we hadn't before, yeah. that they were so yeah. traumatized by this that they were never going to be whole again. That was the theory that was very popular at the time. So I, I would point out, and it's interesting that like, one of the more optimistic stories <laughs> that was written was Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises that basically posited, no, 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 the lost generation are stronger than you think that they are. 
that they are better people than you think that they are, that they are salvageable people. And it's an, it's, it was a, a fuck you in a lot of ways to that kind of narrative. And I think, and I hope that this, this show will borrow a lot from that because it's obviously very much indebted to a long history of actually understanding of, of, of narratives that are about what happens after the war and can yeah. people ever heal again? And, and the answer is yes, I think they can. Or some people have posited. Yeah. Hemingway literally said we're stronger in the broken places. Well, especially because the broken places are the places, and you know, we were talking about this earlier, where we can be skeptical, where we can be critical of the enterprise that made us. Like even though we come back from the war and we become whole in our own ways again, we can also we also develop this newly uh, aware vision of what war is, right? So you know, like somebody like Wilfred Owen, who is a is a First World War poet who wrote from the battlefield. He writes this extraordinary poem in 1920 called Dulce et Decorum Est which is a, a phrase that was constantly being sort of told to people, which means um, it is sweet and right. It is good and right. And the point of it is that it is good and right to die for your country. And so he writes this extraordinarily vivid and violent poem about what it's like to die in war. And, that, and, and it's a poem that is critical of the war effort, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> World War I still doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. And he, he says at the end of the poem, this is the lie we tell. Right. So even those who return from war, broken or whole, they can they can develop a new kind of wholeness through their own skeptical stance on the war project. Yeah. And I, I mean, really kind of bringing it back to the audience that's watching this in real time, I think we... Um, are grappling with a lot of the similar questions um, after yeah. the Trump years, after the COVID pandemic. In a few months, we as a nation are going to be looking at each other and saying, now what? And yes. And the fact of the matter is sometimes it's actually good. To, we can do better. Like the Roaring Twenties were like legit good time. I think they're often forgotten <laughs> uh, because – you know, they ended badly with the Great Depression and all that, but <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't invalidate the 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 living that people did during that time. And I think we can yeah. I think we should revisit those kind of narratives right now. It would also not surprise me if um if everybody is vaccinated um in time for this, my guess, and a lot of people are speculating about this, it's not just me that this summer is going to be a kind of a wild time because people want to reconnect with one another. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if they're, and I, and I, maybe there's some real hope politically speaking in that because the 1920s was also an extraordinary time of, you know, sort of rethinking, for example, gender norms right. and, and race, and, you know, sort of the, and race. Exactly. I mean, they right? had their like, own so, reactionaries, but that was because so many people were pushing the boundaries of ra on yeah, race. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so I wouldn't be sad about not only a giant party that lasts the rest of the summer, um, but also, you know, some to go along with that, some real pushing of the boundaries of what it means, you know, to be, as this show suggests, what it means to be American, what it means to belong to a community. Well, on that note, Maeve, thank you so much for all this insight today. Oh, thank you. This was super fun. Amanda, thank you for all that badass commentary. Thank you. All right, Audio Avengers, that is our show for today. We've got two more unique previews for Falcon and the Winter Soldier coming your way this week, so stay tuned to the Marvelous TV Club. If you can, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, or simply tell a friend about our show. And of course, don't forget to look up those organizations Maeve mentioned. Anything you can do to help us spread the word about this show would mean the world to us, but anything you can do for those organizations would also mean the world to us. Until next time, this new Captain America is definitely Mephisto. <laughs> nice. nice. Dick. <laughs>